my biggest uh, power is my interest and my curiosity because at the end of the day they teach you one pro- software but I always search for other software types alternatives start using I even tried to localize my own computer and it just corrupted <laughs> I changed some DLL files and <laughs> it didn't work it was Windows XP uh-huh. and it didn't work I had to format it okay <laughs> that's funny where, where do you think the curiosity comes from Uh, Hussein, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you again. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. I was I was so pleased uh, having you on the session with Veronic. So we decided to have a follow up and have a full interview with you. So I'm really looking forward to learning as much as possible from you. That's the impression that I got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sadat. Uh, so first, maybe give us a recap of where you work. So you work for Sony Electronics. Yes, I am working for Sony Electronics under Sony Europe uh, Global Business Services. And uh, we are located in Istanbul. And now I am working as a localization solutions consultant within Sony. Can you maybe give us an idea what Sony Electronics means? When somebody says Sony, to me, the first thing that comes to mind is PlayStation 5. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is that the correct division that you're part of or is it something else? Of course, it means uh, more than that for me because it means, you know, innovation. It means, you know, unlimited boundaries. And it also means, you know, uh, passion because we are always motivated to work with passion. We are always motivated to bring innovation and our management is always open to innovations, new ideas. So that motivates us and that uh, always puts new goals in front of us even sometimes we put our own goals and then we try to catch them that means sorry for me i had this question but i lost it yes i'm still wondering like so i remember from your linkedin profile that it says that you worked for sony before and then you changed to sony electronics are they two different or no actually uh, they are the same but the thing is uh, there are two entities in linkedin i don't know how they are managed but then you type Sony, Sony and Sony Electronics come. I just updated my profile when I get a promotion and it turned out Sony Electronics all of a sudden. I don't know how, but okay. in terms of legal entity, nothing changes. They are, I am still in the same company since 2012. Mm-hmm. So you work from Turkey. You also teach at the Turkish University, right? That's what yes. we learned before. I'm wondering how did you get into localization in the first place? Uh, actually, uh, it's about linked with my uh, academic life because now I am teaching at the university. I start learning translation and localization, and my you know entrance into localization is kind of funny because at the time when I start look, I was a student, translation student. I was doing translations assigned by our professors, but we had a technical translation Yahoo group, a trans professional translator trying to join this group. I was rejected. I was the admin and my another admin. I had a friend, he was another admin and he accepted him and he started typing, okay, this is a student group, what's your interest and so on. And he invited us and we met him, we met him and he taught us WordFest. And my interest started there. I start using WordFest in the assignments and all of a sudden I start searching other alternatives. I found Trados, I installed Trados demo version and I noticed <laughs> that this is this should be limited and i contacted with uh, one of the localization companies in turkey and they accepted me for their internship program and i started working there as an intern and then after a while they offered me part-time job and throughout my university life i just uh, worked as part-time translator when they have projects how old were you then when you started working for the company uh, i was around uh, 30, uh, so I was around 24. 24. 24, 22, okay. yeah. Yeah, I was also, I also started working in the industry while I was studying at Moravia. I think I was 20, 20 years old. And I never translated ever. <laughs> yeah, but I started as translator actually. Yeah, I just started translating. But my interest, I mean, my biggest uh, 
power is my interest and my curiosity because at the end of the day, they teach you one pro software, but I always search for other software types, alternatives, start using. I even tried to localize my own computer and it just corrupted. <laughs> I changed some DLL files and <laughs> it didn't work. It was Windows XP uh -huh. and it didn't work. I had to format it. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. Where, where do you think the curiosity comes from? Uh, it's about passion. I mean, when you try to learn more things about your job, if first of all, you have to like, you have to be passionate about your job. When you become passionate, you always want to learn more. It's about, you know, reading a book or watching a movie. When you watch a movie, if you like it, you keep on watching and you even forget about the time. So this is like that. So when I start learning it, or when I'm, I'm passionate about a topic, I start reading it and all of a sudden I lost myself. I lose myself in the time and I always try to learn more, test more, t try more. That's the kind of uh, passion for me. Did you have the curiosity since you were younger or is it something that you discovered later once you started working in the industry? Uh, actually, I decided to be translator later. In my high school, I was planning to be a teacher. Uh, but I had a very good uh, score at university entrance exam. And I was, I had only one interest. This was etymology. And I started searching the university curriculum, whether any university gives etymology class. I noticed that my department was giving etymology class. So I just selected for that purpose. My initial goal was to be a teacher and etymologist. But later, I noticed that I am not suitable for etymology <laughs> because etymology was one of my worst classes. And I start, uh, inter I st my interest started for localization and I start learning software. I improved my computing skills and then I start testing tools. Uh, it's just a kind of evolution for me. It's not a kind of one day decision or it's not something I decide to be and then I turned out. No, it's a kind of evolution. First, I learned computer and then my internet grew for localization and so on. So now, I'm wondering about your current job, which is a localization consultant. Mm -hmm. My question is, what exactly does a consultant do? I think I tried to be a consultant at one point as a freelancer, but it was very difficult for me to find some clients that I could be working with. But you are a consultant internally within Sony. So what do you do as a consultant exactly? Actually, this was my first reaction when I was promoted to be consultant because <laughs> the position is created after me. And to my knowledge, consultant is someone who provides freelance consultancy to the companies. But uh, company created, gave a privilege for me and created this position. And uh, and they offered this to me and they explained and they want me to play key role, consultant role in the projects because normally you don't, you know, recruit consultants in your company. And my role was to manage the key projects as a project manager, but also uh, kind of building its workflow, operating it and delivering it to business as usual teams. And uh, my initial goal here is to streamline the process, improve the process bring the best practices to Sony and try to, uh, I don't want to use the word sell, but try to sell it across different departments. For example, I noticed that there are some translation feedbacks and I have meeting with stakeholders and I noticed that they don't have a terminology process. So I am setting up a terminology process for them. Or sometimes they do a new project, they set up a new CMS and then I am telling them, uh, how TMS CMS should be because I know translation site and I gave requirements that may affect the translation or that may improve the translation cost. Or I do content analysis and then I am just telling them, no, this shouldn't be standard translation. This should be transcreation. So it's a kind of multifaceted role. So you have technical role, you have linguistic role, and you have also business role because in the meantime, I have to manage their budget. Does Sony have, are you part of some central group that takes care of all the localization requests or how do you achieve that streamline operations? Because to me, it looks like, like you have to go from team to team and look at their processes and advise them like what should be the best way. 
Uh, how does that work? Uh, in Sony, we are a central team. Uh, we are shared services, global business services. Uh, my team name is global business services, and we are a shared services team. And we are central. What we do, we are going to departments, or sometimes departments come to us, and they explain their transition requirements. And I listen to them. And I, after listening to them, I am just checking their needs, their requirements, and trying to adapt translation realities into their realities, or <laughs> vice versa. Right. Because translators have some rules, but on the other hand, business also have some rules. So I am just trying to bridge them. In, from that perspective, it's, I am acting like an analyst because analyzing the requests and then bridging them. Sometimes I am talking to developers because their requirements is not possible with translation management system. So some internal developments can make job easier. Or sometimes I am asking the developers to change the system, internal system. Sony is open from that perspective. So you can give feedbacks and you can discuss for the changes. And uh, as a central group, my role, it can be, for example, one of translation requests, HR document. It can be legal document. We are just translating in the way as many companies do. But on the other hand, it can be a kind of website. And this website has some background. For example, it has style guide. It should have style guide or it should have terminology. Also, as a central team, I have an advantage. I can see the big picture. Because imagine that I am translating a consumer website and next day I know that support content will be coming about that. Or next day I know that when there is a new product, I know there will be some PR content. So from that perspective, my role is to kind of connect different stakeholders to each other and bring the consistency across all the content. Just yesterday I was recording the next localization news with Vera from Acorbi and Ilan from the Get Translations. And we were talking about the problem that some of the clients have that their teams are sort of siloed. And even mm -hmm. though they have a central localization hub, which has all the knowledge, all the processes, all the tools, there are still some teams who act on a rogue level and they do their own things. Is that something that you're also dealing with? at Sony? Are there people who don't even know that you exist and that you could help them? Uh, actually, at some point they have a translation request and they go to procurement and procurement tell them hey, we have a central translation team. That is one aspect. Another aspect uh, is a kind of word to mouth. So we are doing a project and someone is mentioning about that project and all of a sudden other team becomes aware of us. And also we are closely working with IS teams. So when a project landed to IS What team, is IS? Uh, information uh, systems team, mm -hmm. IT teams. And IT teams uh, notified that stakeholder that, okay, there's a translation team, so you can contact them. But uh, right now I can tell that uh, we, are, we are very uh, famous team inside Sony and everyone knows about us. <laughs> and even though they don't know, uh, we have some contacts who can reach out to us and then they can lead to us. Mm -hmm. How do you promote yourselves within the organization or how did you become popular with everyone? <laughs> uh, first of all, it's about customers. Uh, it's about being customer oriented. We call them internal customers. All of our requesters are our customers. I'm customer oriented and I always think on behalf of them. So I listen to them. I try to understand their needs and I'm always transparent to them. If they ask something and if this is not possible in translation, I am just telling them this is not possible, this is not feasible. And I am not just saying no. I am going always with an uh, alternative. So that makes me popular. And another thing, maybe they see the passion in me and they just make me popular. I'm, I'm at the end of the I'm just a regular consultant and I have average knowledge that's that's probably the basis for you having a good relationships and becoming popular is when you do it when you deliver quality work i was also thinking about if you have some like internal website or if you share like a newsletter 
or how do you share what you have maybe learned mm. from one project that other people could benefit from? How do you communicate internally and market yourself? Yes, I understand. Actually, uh, we are belong to Sony Europe region, but there are some other regions, South Africa, South Africa Asia, or North America, South America. Uh, for those time to time, uh, our department publishes uh, intranet newsletters about the projects, about the achievements we do, or about the projects we deliver. And that uh, makes us known across all the Sony companies. That's another thing. And, and also, uh, we have a approach, we call it one GPS approach. So, when we reach out a department, if we understand some another another team can help them, we are trying to introduce, introduce them. For example, I am talking to one of my customers or my of my contacts and they are just telling that they have some SEO needs. And if I have a SEO team internally, I am helping them to communicate each other. Even though they don't work together, uh, we have knowledge exchange. We have we share our knowledge and we are open to that and we provide support to them. That is uh, how we widespread knowledge about us. One more question about this is, um, I'm curious, do you prefer to have internal resources working on the project or are you full on the vendor strategy? Uh, actually, it's about vendor strategy time to time. It also, it depends on the dynamics of the projects and requirements of the business. For example, if you are working on a very confidential content, you cannot simply send your content to your vendor. Or in certain conditions, your vendor should do that. At the end of the day, as a Sony, as a central team, we are translating many words. And we cannot recruit all the translators internally. So this will be more costly than current uh, work. So instead, we are just trying to balance. For example, for certain roles, we are internally handling and for certain roles, we are relying on vendors. And also, it's about scalability of the organization. It's about how to scale your organization. For example, imagine that we decide that our vendor approach strategy and we decide to recruit all the languages internally. But sometimes we are delivering 10,000 words per day. So if it's, this is not possible with one person, with two, per, even with two translators, this is not possible. So it's about scalability and it's about balancing the work. For the time being, for example, we don't have any internal translators. We only have localization project managers and we work with vendors. But maybe one day we decide to recruit someone as a translator for certain languages. In your LinkedIn profile, it says that uh, one of your core duties is to optimize localization processes and to bring in more automation. And yeah. I'm really wondering how does this process even start? Like how do you optimize something? Uh, in my opinion, it's about questioning the system and not being happy. As a person, I am a kind of always opponent. I am always criticized system processes because I believe anything can be better. Human can be better, processes can be better, tools can be better. And this creates a kind of eye for detail, eye for innovation. And another thing, uh, you can link with many things with your job. For example, robotic process automation or Lean Six Sigma. They are all the practices uh, implement outside translation industry. But uh, if you are flexible enough, you can connect many things. That is what I believe. So op process optimization, if there are some issues, if there are some problems in the process, that means there are some place for improvement. So from that perspective, what I do, I am creating workflows, but for me, they are not ended. They are always open to improvement. So when there are new changes, I can introduce them. The, my biggest advantage as a localization consultant I am the first contact person when we do a project. I set up the environment and then I deliver it to project managers. And then they start using it after go live. So when there are new innovations, new developments, uh, new best practices, I can relate them. So 
For example, I can tell them, hey, this development can be implemented in that workflow. So I am just trying to uh, persuade my business stakeholders about using that. And also, uh, I am open to people's feedback. So I designed the process, but this is my idea. Maybe one of my colleagues has better idea. So I always uh, try to initiate brainstorming. Uh, and sometimes, for example, what they suggest can be not applicable in that scenario because I also believe that everyone has a background. So we should keep that background. For example, I, uh, I am open to changes, but I am always embrace the changes with attention, with attention because uh, some rules are set after certain experiences. For example, you set up a new stage in a transition workflow, but you need to understand how this was set up. Maybe there's initial business requirement and it's a result of that. Uh, so this creates an eye for improvement, eye for optimization. Also, my as a central transition team, my, most of my stakeholders don't know about transition. They are marketing people. They are engineers. So they don't tend to know about the transition. But they have requirements. So I am always discussing with them what they can do, what they cannot do. They are sharing the requirements for me. So while discussing, I am trying to optimize it. Imagine that I have a new department. They want to check the transition. Uh, they want transition to be checked by the countries, sales companies, marketing people. And they want me to send Excel files. I am just telling them, no, we can't do that, of course, but we have a transition management system. They can simply check the transition there. This organically and naturally grown idea. I mean, you don't have to work about that. I, I've been in, in that exact position where we were still sending, I think it was not even Excel sheets. It was uh, Word documents, uh, sending them for a review. It was actually a table within a Word document. So instead of using an Excel spreadsheet, we put the source and the translation in a Word document and we send it to the in-country people because we were afraid that they would not want to do the work in the TMS directly. Yeah. Because it's something like out of the world and we want to give them something very simple to look at and maybe comment and maybe make changes to the translation. So I'm glad that you made it work. Was it maybe struggle getting them to use TMS? Yeah, actually, it, at the very beginning, it was a, some trouble. But uh, in order to streamline the process, okay, I have an SLA. Imagine that five business day SLA. And those people have other duties. Their primary role is not take the exactly. transitions. Yes. So that what I do. I try to bring two parties together. So instead, I prepare the video for training video. I create an account for them. I did some test jobs. They kindly accepted this and they did this. And next day, I create the condition. If they don't check the transition for 48 hours, it should be delivered. Or when they check a translation, if they add a comment, it should be sent back to translators. When they check a translation, if they don't add a comment, it should be delivered again. So. What I do, I am also supporting them. If they are busy and they are not able to check transitions, okay, that's fine. I are just skipping. And I can see the reports and I am just typing them from chat tool. Hey, I noticed that you didn't check transition. Maybe you want to check it. And if they say, that's okay, I am up with transition work, that's okay. And uh, another thing is to facilitate their feedbacks. If you use their feedbacks to train the translators, that's the biggest advantage. Because next time, translators will deliver what they want. Exactly. Yeah. They need to invest some some of their time to increase the quality. Yeah, that's what I am telling them. This is learning curve. And if you train the translators, after a while, you don't need to check translations. So they will be delivered as is. It's funny now that you mentioned it. Yesterday, when we were recording the localization news, one of the things that the guys brought up was close collaboration between the content creators and the developers yeah. on the client side. So this would be you and connecting them directly with the translators on the vendor side. Is this maybe something that you're working on or, or, or that you have implemented? 
so so the people translating the content can directly communicate with the people who create the content again to have a better quality in the end and more streamlined operations in sony we are lucky we can do that we are for example i know copywriters and they know me when they write a copy they can contact me for example even sometimes some copywriters reach out to me saying that hey i don't want this word to be translated or sometimes i am telling them hey when you want to write copy you need to consider translation for example uh, when we first created our website global website we were having uh, cadence meetings with uh, copywriters we were sharing our feedbacks for example we were telling them you are writing so long so translators have to shorten translation and this impacts the quality and then they become aware of that and they start writing in short we are training them and this is also uh, good for them they have visibility because when they write a copy their copy should be translated well in order to uh, in order to bring the customers in order to bring the audience so Uh, from that perspective, our stakeholders always uh, encourage us to communicate. Of course, this is not the case always, but most of the time we can communicate with them. We share the, our feedbacks with them. For example, a uh, few years ago, we started an initiative and we merged our style guides. We merged transition style guide and editorial style guide. At the end of the day, both processes content creation. Translators are also creating content. Mm-hmm. And as long as they are aligned, that's meaningful and that's consistent. So now copy, translators have visibility, the interaction copywriters take, and copywriters have visibility for the translations. And so they always consider both sides. I think somebody has a speech in the background. <laughs> What is going uh, on? I- <laughs> yeah, some say this guy says some stuff outside. <laughs> okay, looks like he finished. Yes. Okay. Mm, yeah. But my question was uh, also related to: Are the translators on your vendor side able to communicate directly with the content creators, or are you always in the middle, or somebody from your team? Actually, direct communication. Uh, we are always in the middle, and. Because sometimes a wrong instructions can be passed to both sides. So we want to be in the middle and we want to become aware of what is going on. Actually, even sometimes we direct reject the instruction, we direct reject the request. We are just telling them, no, you, they can't do that. From that perspective, we always bring translators and countries together. We always encourage them to meet. But on the other hand, Copywriters do not have that visibility. So copywriters can talk to us as a translation management team. And we convert their instructions into translators' instructions. Also, we reflect translators' pains to them. And from translation agency, we have program managers, we have project managers, and we always bring them together so that they know each other and uh, they can share their concerns, questions. Great. When you were talking about the process optimization, you mentioned that one of the first signals to start a process of optimization is when a process has issues. But I would say that in in my opinion, it's uh, this is the dangerous thing because many people can think that the process is working for them uh, and they are not aware that there could be a better alternative. You know, so then yeah. they probably wouldn't come to you and say, hey, something's not working. Because in my experience, usually uh, when the project managers on, let's say, the vendor side, like the client is happy with the deliveries, the, pro- pro- the projects are delivered on time, on budget, quality is fine. In most cases, I would say probably people will not be looking for ways to optimize it. Like don't break something that's uh, that's working. Yeah. How do you go about this Like, do you have maybe some, I don't know, like some regular revisions of the processes, even if nobody comes to you and say something is not working? How do you feel about looking into something that is supposedly working? Uh, actually, we, as you said, I mean, you cannot always evolve the processes and change them. But on the other hand, uh, recently I read an article from Harvard Business Review and it was saying, I mean, 
companies should frequently update their processes because this is for improvement. But in order to do that, we are utilizing a tool. We are recording defects, issues, and we are doing root cause analysis together. And after discussing root cause, doing root cause analysis, we find a reason. And if this is the process change, okay, I have the tool. I am just updating process, but this is not something I am just changing and then implementing, but this is rather comes out of analysis, root cause analysis done jointly. And also uh, another thing, I mean, I should show the benefits of the change. If this is financial benefit, I should calculate it. If this is turnaround time benefit, I should show this. And may, for example, sometimes I am just bringing an idea and this is rejected. That's also possible. And they don't, they say, I am not interested in cost benefit. I am not interested in process time, lead time benefit. So, okay. I am just saying, okay, I don't have anything to do, but I should show them the benefit in terms of lead time, error proofness, and also uh, cost. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the root cost analysis uh, that's done on the defects. What kind of defects are we talking about? Is it during the localization process or maybe if one of the end consumers complain about something? What do you guys actually analyze? Uh, for example, imagine that uh, imagine that one of the agencies continually delivering late or imagine that some translators uh, don't change the placeholders in Trados and this causes a quality issue. You are seeing wrong numbers in the front end. So this is escalated to us and we do an analysis and we notice that translators delivered wrong or translate delivered late. We are looking at the fact for that. And after a while, as a business excellence cons as a business excellence partners within our team, I am taking those defects, I am analyzing and calculating their cost impact and VOC impact. And I bring I organize a meeting with project managers, translators agency project managers and even sometimes with our internal customers and we start discussion i am always asking why 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 continually asking why sometimes it turns frustrating for others uh, but this is the essence of the root approach. cost analysis yeah mm -hmm. i am asking and when i reach a point the why is are meaningless then i am stopping asking why but I found a reason and this time I am asking how we can avoid this, how we, what should we change, how we can not repeat that. I ask people's idea and we start doing brainstorming. For example, someone says, oh, okay, if you add a buffer, you won't have delay. And my project manager says, no, I can't add buffer because I have a standard SLA with my party. And someone says, I am experiencing delay because I do many jobs manually. Then we are looking into automation whether this is possible or not. Or someone says, okay, I am using the wrong version of the uh, tool. Then we are asking them to upgrade. We are recording all those actions. We are assigning them to people. And then regularly we are having meetings to follow this up. When you look at the overall plan at the end of the day, you change your process, you change your approach, you change your way of working because those actions turn to a reality. And people start following those actions. For example, they change their tool, they change their approach, or they change how they work. Because, I mean, process change is not something you are just building process from scratch, you are removing some steps, or you are adding some steps, or you are designing. Pro no, actually, this is just uh, bringing new steps, or removing some steps, or it's about sometimes uh, changing how you do it. You mentioned uh, delivering late uh, as one of the issues that you would be looking into. So that uh, made me curious about KPIs. Are there any yeah. central KPIs that you monitor? Uh, actually, in our team, every we are just uh, splitting jobs according to experts. For example, consumer website is managed by someone, professional website is managed by someone, and they have different KPIs. Those business people have different KPIs. So we are flexible to uh, convert our KPIs into their expectation. 
But of course overall we are putting some KPIs in front of our vendors and they have to follow that. One is cost, the other one is uh, other one is lead time, turnaround time. So we have standard SLAs with them and they have to fulfill that. And we are continually measuring those lead times. And if we see a kind of change in the overall trend, we are approaching them. And another thing I like in our team, this is something my manager initiated. Uh, we are having regular meetings with our vendors. And this is every year we are having regular meetings with our vendors see, every six months. And uh, one of the target of that meeting is to bring an idea. So we encourage our vendors to bring an idea to us. Yeah, I'm smiling because uh, when I was working at Autodesk, so that was my only time when I was working on the client side, I had this idea that we should start this initiative, which I called Box of Ideas. And uh, Autodesk at that time had four vendors. And I basically wanted them to do the same thing that you just mentioned, that uh, we would kind of like make like a... We would gamify their effort to bring in some innovations and some suggestions yeah. back to us and maybe like have like a leaderboard like let's say this vendor came up with this many ideas this vendor came up with this many ideas and that would kind of like propel the, the the innovation you know so that the vendors don't feel like they just have to be on the receiving end of the innovation because many times it's just the client that thinks like they know better but this would be like an open way and collaborative way and also a little bit exactly. competitive way how you can you know, leverage the expertise of the of the whole team that's working on it. Exactly. Also, uh, sometimes we start discussing their idea and we are just, for example, we are questioning. And this also helps them to understand our site. From our questions, they can get that. Okay, I mean, these are the requirements for GBS. So these are the, how they work and they understand us better. This mm-hmm. initi- kind of uh, initiate the communication. You seem to me like you're a very <laughs> professional and calm person and you always approach everything with a calm head. But I'm curious if you had experience with people underperforming, I would assume on the vendor side. And do you sometimes like lose your emotions? Do you get emotional about work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I was not. <laughs> I was not. I was a kind of a bit excited person. But uh, I just took some classes, just took some uh, trainings in order to control my emotions because being consultant is to moderate. You have to moderate and you have to consider from all perspectives. And you shouldn't be emotional. This is also the reality of professional life. So now I am a kind of moderator approaching to business stakeholders, telling them. Of course, I don't fight with anyone else in the office. I mean, this is not up to me. But sometimes I warn them uh, if they do something wrong on purpose or if they do something which impacts my client, I warn them and I ask them to do a root cause analysis and ask them to bring a solution to me about how to avoid this. At the end of the day, we are human. Human is to err. There is a saying like that. So anyone can do a mistake, but the thing is, these mistakes shouldn't be repeated. Uh, this also comes from uh, our DNA. I mean, we log the defects not to find a scapegoat, but we log the defects to find the issue. I mean, if the per- process is human dependent, this is not reliable. This is not uh, sustainable. So this process should be human independent. And I mean, anyone shouldn't uh, overperform in order to run the job. I mean, process should be lean. Do you have someone on your team or are there plans to grow a team around uh, you or? Actually, I am a standalone person in the team. I am directly reporting my manager. Uh, I am consultant and we have another analyst in the team. And I am closely working with the analyst. Also, we have project managers and uh, delivery manager in our team. Uh, delivery manager and his team, her team is... Uh, I'm responsible to do daily deliveries. If this is website content, website content. If this is HR document, HR document. My role is to set up the processes, to manage the technology, or bring the best cases, or to understand customer needs. 
For example, we are having if there is a kind of weird job or different job comes to our team, my team comes to me and tells me about the job, and I try to understand what it is. And if I have an idea, I suggest it. Sometimes my manager, uh, the other department heads approach to my manager for the localization project, and she inc- involves me, and then I start try to understand what is going on and how we should do it and whether we should do it or not. Or sometimes I can even say, okay, this is not human translation. Just machine translation will be enough. I mean, it doesn't have to be done by translators. So my role is like that, is to build the workflow and setup and operate it for a while and until it becomes a, a stable. And after that, I am just delivering to delivery manager and her team. Let's talk about Six Sigma. Yes. So this is something you already mentioned. It's not typical for localization. It doesn't come from localization. It comes from production, if I'm not mistaken, manufacturing. Yeah. So please tell us what the Six Sigma is about and how do you see the adaptation to localization? Uh, actually, Lean Six Sigma is not something I just learned on my own, but in our organization, we have a business excellence consultant and she, her role is to uh, improve the maturity of organization, implement the Lean Six Sigma methodology and she helped me to learn. I took some classes, company uh, encouraged me to take some classes. I attend some uh, on-site trainings and then uh, I noticed that, I mean, this is a kind of mindset. This is not about manufacturing or this is not about protection, but it's about mindset. You always, and the initial principle of Six Sigma is continuous improvement. You can always improve the process. You can always uh, change things. And in order to do that, sometimes you take longer route. Sometimes you take shorter route. I mean, when we say improving a process, we always think that it's about shortening a process. But, I mean, it's about your goal. If you want to improve the quality, you can add some other steps. And with Lean Six Sigma, we start implementing a defect logging system. And with that defect logging system, we start implementing root cause analysis. It's like a, you know, a snowball. It's growing. And uh, how I, I mean, how I do that in localization, I once, I was translator. I also worked as a project manager. I also worked as a kind of salesman in translation industry. So... This taught me anything can be improved and translation and localization industry is not perfect. There are many things to improve. So Lean Six Sigma uh, create a kind of initiative for me. So I decided to share this knowledge with anyone. So that's why I wrote an article. And uh, this is also about how you can improve your maturity. Because you ask me how you catch the innovation, how you catch the optimizing the process. This is how I catch the optimization. I am always looking for improvement. I am always looking for continuous change. That is Lean Six Sigma taught me. And this is how I approach, how have I reached to processes. Mm-hmm. Is there anything more for you to implement uh, other than the root cause analysis and logging the defects? Sure. Uh, actually, uh, Lean Six Sigma has many tools. For example, one of the tools is called... Uh, SS matrix. SS matrix. In SS matrix, what you do, you are just uh, changing some, you are just listing some uh, outputs, bad results, and then you are also listing all kind of possible reasons. And with a team, you are scoring them. And after scoring them, with, you can start changing the first thing on the list. With the highest score. This is useful tool. Another tool uh, is you are just calculating risk priority number. In the process, while designing a process, you are sitting with your team. You are putting your uh, process map and you start discussing the possible issues. For example, one say, okay, uh, we can experience translation delay here because of that. Okay, and then you are just calculating a risk priority number. With risk priority number is calculated by severity 
frequency uh, how you how frequently you do it and at the end of the day you receive a risk priority number and you try to mitigate those risks and another tool uh, I really like is SIPOC you are just drawing a process you are listing inputs outputs and suppliers and also you are listing all clients customers I mean in customer here does not mean that the person who give you the money the customer here is, is the one who deliver your output for example I am a translator I deliver translation proofreader is my customer proofreader completes the job delivers job to project manager project manager is the customer Project manager sends the job to localization engineer. Localization engineer is the customer. So that creates an ecosystem, brings all stakeholders together, and you have full over full map. What impacts who? And you start discussing together, and you find the bottlenecks in the process. And any another tool, which is also common in. Uh, Business word, VOC, voice of customer. You circulate a survey, you get the results, and from that results, you are just uh, defining measurable, measurable outputs, critical to okay, quality, CTQ, we call them CTQ. For example, imagine that you are preparing a coffee, and your customers told you, uh, my coffee is bitter, my coffee is not dark. So, Bitterness, you cannot measure it. Mm -hmm. So you are just trying to convert this into a measurable mm -hmm. format. For example, you tell them, if I put one spoon of coffee, it won't be bitter. So one spoon of coffee is measurable. Every time you calculate whether you put one spoon of coffee or not. Or sugar, you, are, you can measure it. The core of Lean Six Sigma is uh, something, and it says... You cannot improve the things you cannot measure if you don't measure. So in order to improve it, you have to measure it. So that brings you a mindset to record everything, to measure everything, and to improve everything. Now that you mentioned to measure everything, are you by any chance utilizing big data somehow for localization? Uh, actually, big data is something, you know, fancy word. Everyone's using that, but... I mean, <laughs> uh, but big data, we are just uh, using some uh, translation management report, management system reports. For example, lead time that measure translators lead time, even uh, rep reports that shows us how long does it take to go from one stage to other stage. Also, we have reports that measure, uh, measure the issues we experienced on the process. For example, you upload a file to TMS and all of a sudden it went to recovery or exception. We are having reports about those and we under, try to understand why we have them. Also, we have reports that shows us response time. We upload job to TMS and I can see when the translators get the job. So, if the translator got the job one day later, I mean, project manager cannot tell me he just did a delay I mean, because you sent the job one day later. So from that perspective, we are using data. I am not sure whether it's, it is big or it is as big as you expect, but we are using translation management system reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now that you're talking about the translation management systems, do you have any one preferred solution or do you try to use different tools for different teams based on their requirements? Uh, we are currently using one tool, one translation management system, but within Sony, for websites, we built our own translation management system. It's an automated system, and this automated system talks to our translation management system where translators translate. Our internal translation management system is not for translators. It is like an adapter, or it's like a hub. And the our translation management system, we deeply customize it. I mean, we are not using it out of the box, but we implement many customization. Sometimes it is not manageable, I accept, but <laughs> at the end of the day, business is happy, 
and we are just trying to implement them. Is it just to monitor the <clears throat> the website localization pro- progress, or is it to send the content to the TMS? Uh, internal team is to send the content to TMS because we are centralizing translation memory in our internal system. So many different translation management system, if they share the same data, they are using it. Why we don't it in TMS? Maybe you can ask that because at the end of the day, there's translation memory there. Uh, internal translation management system increases the speed. Also, it re- manages the repetitions. So we don't have to implement cross-file repetition in our TMS. Or sometimes we can change the freq urgency of the job from internal system. So this is for automation. And with the help of that tool, we don't have to manually create the jobs in TMS. It's automatically sending and receiving and sending back to CMS. We are monitoring the tool and we are updating the tool. For example, uh, another benefit of this tool, imagine that we decided a trademark for one term. We can download all the transition. We can simply add trademark for all the terms and we can upload it. And all of a sudden, all transition memories will be updated and CMS will be updated. So you don't have to send it to translators and then menu will change them. Mm-hmm. One thing that I've noticed on your profile is that you lead translation stream for key digital yeah. projects. What, what does a translation stream mean? Uh, translation stream, actually, uh, when we do transfer digital projects, there are many stakeholders. One of the stakeholders is content management team. Other stakeholders, information systems, IT systems, IT teams. And I am another stakeholder. And we call all of those stakeholders responsibility area as a stream. So my role is to manage translation and localization stream. So I am managing all kinds of operations in that area. I am the person who creates term list. I am the person who creates style guide. I am the person who manages the translators. But that does not mean that I am just working individually and isolated. So all those teams come together, share their experience and feedbacks, and work together. That's why we call them stream, because it helps us to lean in mm-hmm. the project. Mm-hmm. How do you remember starting and implementing machine translation? And how, where where are you now Like as a Sony? Do you have your own engine? Do you utilize something? Uh, we don't have our own engine, but we are working with our uh, vendors and we ask them to implement machine translation time to time when they are required. They implement it and we utilize it in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for machine translation, we are always open. We are, we are not, uh, for example, you, we don't use pure machine translation. Sometimes we use post editing because we have public data and we cannot just publish. And the, what is different in our area, we sell hardware. So if we put a wrong copy there, it may end up with a legal case. So that's why we are careful about content quality. But of course, there are some scenarios where pure machine translation can be used. And on such cases, we are utilizing some machine translation tools hosted by our vendors. Uh, you already mentioned the robotic process automation. And you even yeah. wrote an article about that. Uh, could you describe us what, what, it, what it is about? Uh, actually, robotic process automation is, you can imagine as a kind of macro. Okay. And this, what this macro does, you can apply it in any place. The main idea behind this, writing this article to attract attention of localization community and increase the awareness of uh, robotic awareness of, about machine robotic process automation, because you know uh, maybe someone's applying from somewhere in the localization community. But robotic process automation, uh, what you do, you take a process and you find the non-value add tasks. For example, you have a, you are creating a report in daily basis to see the status of your translations. So you are spending some time to create this report and this doesn't add any value to your job because your customer does, is not aware of that or it doesn't add anything to your customer. Do you do that report for your own purpose? 
So you can ask robot to create it. And you will say 2 minutes, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is. Or imagine that you are just having a two file, Excel and Word file. And you have to take one sentence and then you have to paste it to Excel one by one. You don't like it. And it doesn't add any value to your job. And it is not meaning of your life. Right. <laughs> so you can ask robot to do it. The main idea behind robotic process automation, you are analyzing your process and the, you are just asking robot to automate the processes that doesn't have any value at, also that doesn't require any decision. Such as, imagine that, uh, I, how can I apply that to your localization industry? You are a translator and there's a marketplace. First come, first serve. Job is posted in marketplace and you always have to refresh the website. Uh, it's not enjoying. You have to do your translations. So you can set up a report, a robot, and it can refresh on your behalf. And when the job comes, it automatically accepts. I mean, this is how we can set it up. <laughs> or imagine that you are doing translation jobs and you have to upload them to your TMS. At the end of the day, your value is to translate. Your value is not to upload the translation. So you can put your translations into a folder and robot can take them and upload them on your behalf. So there are many steps we follow and they don't have any value. They don't add any value. Some of them are value enabling, but not value adding. So we can uh, use people's energy and uh, brain for decisions for more creative works. So robots can do such kind of uh, non-value tasks or easy tasks or the task people don't happy to do. The word robot is a little bit abstract to me. I can just imagine some, you know, actual robot doing <laughs> something thing. But how, how, how would you automate something or robotize something when it comes to translation? Are there any special tools that where you record the sequence of the steps that you do on a computer and it remembers? Uh, yes, actually, robot is not a physical thing. It's a software. And uh, it works like a person. It is hosted on a server or on your computer. And you just trigger the action and then software starts running. It works like a macro. And the uh, common tools, there are many tools in the place, but uh, my favorite tool is UiPad. I like it because it is just drag and drop. I am not a programmer, so I am just creating robot by dragging and dropping. And other tool uh, that's uh, famous is Blue Prism. It is more enterprise, uh, more, exp more uh, expensive. UiPath is a free version, for example. You can apply it. Uh, and what you do, first of all, you have to create your process. And you have to create your sequence of steps at keystroke level. And you map them in the UiPath interface. And you define the action type. For example, action can be read email. Action can be send email. Action can be refresh. You are just defining those actions and then it starts doing what you want. For example, once I did a report a robot for my wife, she was getting some names from one website and then pasting into them in Excel. The website does not give any export. She is refreshing, copying, pasting, refreshing, copying, pasting, refreshing, and she asked my help. And I don't like such kind of things. So instead, I start investigating. I decide maybe there's a macro. And I found this RPA tool. I did a small tool. And I just said, okay, it will finish in 10 minutes. And she said, no, it won't. I said, yes, yes, no worries. <laughs> this, I said dinner and she said, you didn't do it. I said, okay, it's doing, don't worry. <laughs> I, showed, I showed her my screen and my, you know, uh, my mouse pointer was just moving around the screen on its own. It was refreshing, copying and pasting, refreshing, copying and pasting. Uh, for example, today, for example, we apply this robot for certain reports. I mean, it, we use it for our own purpose in order to follow up their jobs. 
So why should I try to create a report every day? And robot is creating and sending an email to me. Thank you for the tip for the successful marriage, a robotic process automation. <laughs> the other article that you wrote about, and this is what I'm really curious about because I'm open to trying it out right now is about the Pomodoro technique. So I'm really curious how you apply Pomodoro technique. So maybe first give us a quick introduction to Pomodoro technique and then how you apply it during your day. Actually, Pomodoro technique is not something uh, you can utilize in your continuous job. For example, while calculating a budget, you can't use it because you don't have to be you don't have to be interrupted. But while doing a transition, you can use it. While doing an engineering work, you can do it. And the, uh, how I get that? Pomodoro technique. Let me first introduce Pomodoro technique. You are splitting your day into phases, short breaks. Uh, for example, you are just thinking that I will work continually without any interruption for 20 minutes, and then I will take five minutes break. You take five minutes break, and then. You stop another 20 minutes, 5 minutes break, third 20 minutes work, and then this time you take 10 minutes. And what I noticed that I was, you know, lecturing at university, I have to prepare some slides, and I am not able to focus. So I have a fo- I had a focus problem. And meanwhile, I want to read some books, but I am not able to focus. So I just thought I should find a technique about that. While talking a friend, He mentioned that there is a technique called Pomodoro. I start searching and Pomodoro is a kind of uh, tomato in Italian. There are tomato timers. And uh, I start, I just search an application. I am sure someone invented it. And I noticed there are some apps. I installed easy, the easiest one. I set up 20 minutes and now 5 minute break. 20 minutes, 5 minute breaks. I started, I noticed that it is effective. And you can use it. And I remember the days I was translator. I, for example, while translating, I was start searching a term, and then I end up a forum reading something else. This is how translators face in uh, disruption or the disturbance. So I thought it can be helpful for translators. That's why I decided to wrote about it. And this is I ha- how I applied Pomodoro in my life. How does the timer help you focus? That part I don't understand. Uh, actually, you set the timer and you leave it around. And after that point, you have to pay attention. You shouldn't uh, care about anything else. You shouldn't touch your phone. You shouldn't play the things on your desk. You should only focus on the things you set. And imagine that you are doing a five pages of translation and you only do the five pages of translation. You are not watching Netflix or you are not playing with the game or you are not playing with the Facebook account. You only do the uh, translation. After 20 minutes, timer bells. You heard the voice, you heard the uh, ring and then you stop. And during five minutes, you are not, this time you are not touching the task. You are not looking into translations. But you do what you want. At the end of the five minutes, the timer again rings. And then this time you are going back to work. And then you start working again. It works like that. So the essence here is not the tool or is not the timer. Essence here is the uh, ambition to stay focused. And you are paying attention not to disturb. Right. But you can do that even without a timer, right? Does the timer help you like... You set yourself a goal to achieve within that one Pomodoro. And that's why, let's say, maybe you give yourself a time limit. So that puts a pressure on you. So you're like, instead of doing some other things, you want to actually complete and focus on that one task. Exactly. That's what the tool does. For example, when you start a task, you are saying, I can complete that task in five Pomodoros. So you plan your day in that way. And... You set up five Pomodoros in your app and then you start working. First Pomodoro went, second, third, fourth, fifth, you should complete it. So in order to catch the time, you are always, you always stay focused. Do you, 
use it yourself? Because I, you mentioned that for continuous work, and I'm not sure what exactly you meant by that. To me, it's more like when I'm in the momentum, when I'm in the zone, when I'm really doing something that I cannot finish within, the, let's say, 25 minutes, then I don't want to be in trap. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes I'm preparing a budget. In budget, you have to consider many things. You have to talk with other people. And you have to be careful. And you do a calculation. In the middle of the calculation, imagine that the bell rings. Yeah. So you don't want to be disturbed. That's why I say I mean, you shouldn't do it in a continuous works or some calculations. Rather, you should do it more stable and uh, you should do it in a uh, standard jobs rather than doing in a kind of changing or fluctuating jobs. Or, for example, uh, you have to have a meeting. You cannot do it with Pomodoro because at one point meetings can take longer than expected. <laughs> right, yeah. I know that... We were supposed to have our interview yesterday, but you were busy with the meetings. Is that how most of your day uh, look like? Is is it mostly meetings? How do you yes. start and schedule your day? Actually, uh, I'm a project person. I don't have business as usual. I, am, I don't have standard translation routines. Uh, that's a good thing I like about my life. I don't like routines. So I always have new projects. I always have some tasks and on week weekly basis, I am putting some tasks. We are discussing it uh, with my manager and we decide together and those tasks should be completed a certain time. So I always have my plan in front of me. I am checking them and then I start working on them. I am planning my day. The first thing I did in the morning is to plan my day. So I put all my meetings in the calendar. I also put the tasks. And I assigned some estimated time for them. I start doing that. I attend meetings. Actually, uh, for a few years, my life is more standard. I don't have unexpected meetings frequently, but sometimes it happens. Uh, I spend most of my time by attending meetings because sometimes uh, there are some jobs that they have issue or there are some jobs they need improvement or there are some jobs our customers are not happy or there are some jobs Customers are super happy and want to do something else. And I am attending such meetings to understand their needs or to guide them or to tell what is possible, what is not possible or how we can implement such kind of discussions. And uh, this is how my life goes on. And other than that, of course, I am supporting my friends, teammates. Sometimes when they have an issue, they come to me and I am supporting them. This is how I work. This is a good question for you. What are you curious about right now? Uh, I am curious about right now about intelligent robotic process automation. Oh, that's the next level. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because RPA is now old technology. They call it old technology. For me, it is new. Uh, intelligent robotic process automation improves the, uh, brings the decision making into robotic process automation. This is, I mean, this does not exist in robotic process automation. And also, I am trying to... Is it, sorry, uh, is it implementation of AI into the yes, robotic process? Yes, exactly, exactly. It's implementation of AI because system tries to mimic your behaviors and decisions. And in order to do that, you have to have full map full with unhappy paths in the process and exceptions. So uh, system makes some decisions. You can imagine it like that. You are having a standard translation job and you say, if the word count is more than that, set it up deadline in this day. And if the content is legal, assign it to that translator. It works like that. So human decisions also taken by robot, but they are not advanced decisions. They are primitive decisions. Mm -hmm. And another thing currently I am focused on is mindfulness. I am trying to learn mindfulness yeah. and apply it in my life. Same here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it is very important. I noticed that it improves situational awareness. Also, it brings more quality to your life. It is good to become aware of your life and aware of things around you. Now, how do you go about that? Like, what have you learned so far? Uh, mindfulness, first of all, I learned you have to listen yourself. And how I start that, I start reading a book just out of curiosity. And then I just start testing. And then it took me to 
emotional quotient EQ. I start reading about that in order to improve my empathy. Uh, once I was lack of empathy. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I just thought I start uh, searching some courses and I found some Coursera course. It was very cool. I mean, uh, you, the instructor gave you some assignments. You have to complete them. There are peer reviews and you start discussions and so on. It's so effective. And now I am trying to find some books and I am trying to know myself. Uh, also, there are some practices you can apply in your home, such as meditation and so on. So I am doing those. Uh, actually, it's not something I am totally new. Uh, once I was practicing Aikido. In the essence of Aikido, you have to become aware of yourself and your neighborhood. So it attracted my attention. Now I am trying to learn it better and apply it to my life. Have you read the book, The Power of Now? That's the one I read about. No, not yet. I will read it. But I just uh, read some Turkish books. Oh, about I see, I see. What do you think is wrong with our industry? Uh, I don't want to say it is wrong. But of course, there are some improvement points. Yes. Again, coming to my point. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, everything is uh, built with an experience. So we cannot call them wrong, but we can call them outdated. We can call them needs to be improved and so on. Uh, I mean, for example, we can bring more automation and DTP processes can be better. For example, I don't like DTP processes and they are still so long. There should be a way of streamlining them. Or there can be standards about DTP tools. For example, you either have to have InDesign, you either have to have uh, ink and so on. So there should be standards about that. And uh, CMS and TMS integrations can be standardized. For example, there are many CMSs and they are all have different uh, protocols that can be standardized. Uh, those are things that need to be improved. Uh, and other than, I don't think there are bad things in our industry, but there are points to improve. How are you thinking about improving the DTP processes? I mean, there should be standard about it. I mean, we shouldn't rely on the tools. For example, uh, applications. When I first started the translation, we were doing screen tests. We were doing software tests. And now, I mean, you don't experience trans truncation in the software because internationalization improved that. You don't experience, you know, image overlay because responsive designs find an answer to that. So... I mean, there should be a way of managing that in DTP process as well. So this is not about translation, but this is about the tools where we create this creative content, collaterals. So standardization start, should start from that. And all tools, all DTP tools should export an XML file, maybe. Same kind of XML. Attributes are well defined. And those XMLs should be used by translation tools and... In that way, it can be standardized. What are you excited about in 2020? Uh, do you ask my honest opinion or uh, optimistic opinion? <laughs> you can give my, us both. Okay, my honest opinion. I set my expectations at minimum for 2020. It didn't start well. It's not going well, honestly speaking, because we have pandemic and we are just locked in the house. We are not going outside. Uh, my biggest excitement about... 2020 is to finish it as early as possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is to have 2021. Uh, actually, this is my honest opinion, but my optimistic opinion is, I mean, we are just trying to get used to new way of working and we become more flexible. And this also transforms the companies about workforce, about workplace. And uh, this is good thing. For example, I know from my friends in the past some companies are not familiar with the work from home or they are not always skeptical about that kind of approach but now I mean they have to all work from home luckily our organization is always you know supporting work from home so on first day of working from home we didn't even have an issue we quickly started we didn't have an issue we already have our setups and so on So this is the biggest thing and biggest takeaway from 2020. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you change your mind about? 
during your life journey? Uh, actually, I'm kind of flexible person. So I'm always start uh, being excited about new things. That makes me kind of inconsistent. <laughs> But uh, my, I mean, biggest change in my life is to learn importance of communication. I mean, it is not about doing your job good. It's not about you can be genius. I mean, you can be best person in the room. But as long as you don't communicate, I mean, you cannot sell your ideas. You cannot persuade other people, or you can uh, disturb other people. So my biggest change, especially within few years. I mean, I learned the importance of communication and I learned the importance of empathy. That's my biggest transformation in my life. So on the other hand, is there something absurd or stupid that you still do? Uh, of course, there are some stupid <laughs> things I do. Uh, one of them is... Yeah, for example, while working, I take on my headset... But I don't. I always forget to play the music. <laughs> This is absurd thing I do. <laughs> uh, I mean, another thing about my work, I am very conservative about my computer setup, and obsessed about uh, speed of my computer. Uh, at the end of the day, this is just a computer, and at the end of the day, you will finish the job. I mean, you, why you are worrying about the computer speed? I think like that when I think a lot, but in reality, I don't follow that. Whenever it got stuck, I turn crazy and I start <laughs> talking to it. And it's nonsense. <laughs> it is not changing or it doesn't think that, oh, okay, I just disturbed you saying I offend him, so I should work faster. It doesn't <laughs> say it like that. Uh, this is the most absurd thing I do. <laughs> okay. What is your computer right now? My computer, my personal PC is Asus. And my work piece is HP. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, is there anything I should have asked you, but I didn't? Mm, no, I think we discussed lots of things. Thank you very much, actually, for your time Thank and you, for Steve. giving this opportunity to me. So, okay, we're not going to wrap up. So, your final words first. This is my usually my final question. So, this is your opportunity to speak to everyone in the industry. What would you tell them? Uh, we should be more open. To share our opinions and to share our experiences and uh, people should always share their knowledge that's my only word to the car otherwise we cannot improve yeah are you going to start a youtube channel with me where we can share our experience <laughs> why not of course that's one of the reasons why i actually started doing like youtube and the podcast and my website everything i just really wanted to like dump all my knowledge before i forget about it you know just to the rest of the world and You guys deal with it. Actually, it's a good idea. Uh, I do it through my students. I am always mm -hmm, sharing mm -hmm, with them. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I don't have time to write. Uh, I want to write more articles, but I'm not able to write because of the two kids. I have two kids, and uh, this they restrict me. And uh, but I am just trying to share my knowledge with my students, and I always ask them to challenge me. And they challenge. We do brainstorming, and we learn. Both sides learn. This is how I do. But I think fi I should find more effective way of doing that. Yeah. This is one way, I think, through a podcast. It's one too many people. Like People can always pull the knowledge that you just shared with us. So thank you again, Hussein, for the interview. Thank you very much. A pleasure Thanks a lot you. for your time. All It's right. a pleasure for me as well. See you next time, Hussein. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.